Okay, so in today's lecture we're going to in today's lecture we're going to finish off our discussion of nervous tissues and finish off the core space. Uh, next week's lecture there will be one uh, for those of you who want to show up. Uh, we'll feature the exam review game, which I will design for this course. Basically, we'll involve you guys running around and answering questions. So I don't have to do a lot of talking. You guys will. Well, you guys will do a lot of writing. So if you want to do an exam review game, show up next week. Um, we will basically make up random questions, potential questions to the exam, and then you guys will have a little bit of time to try to answer them. We will work in groups. You are allowed to use your notes, so please don't forget to go out and use your notes and answer the questions as fully as you can. And then we will critique the answers and make fun of you. <laughs> But we will critique the answers that you've given just so you can see what sort of things I might be looking for in the kind of questions that we will be talking about. Okay? So again, uh, if you don't want to come in, you don't have to, you're not missing anything, uh, there's nothing new, uh, there will be no new material covered, but um, again, if you want to get a good idea of how to prepare for the exam, you're fine. Uh, if you don't already have a good idea of how to do it, uh, this will be one of the ways that we can do it, and so please feel free to show up, and make sure you bring your notes. So, today's lecture is going to be on nervous tissues, and this time we'll be focusing on the peripheral nervous system as opposed to the central nervous system. And so, we will be focusing on everything outside of this. So, if we use nerves that we see leaving the spinal cord, and leaving the spinal cord, is what we'll be focusing our attention on today. And so, we will talk a little bit about the ganglion, the peripheral ganglion. Spinal ganglia, which you can see here, and just ganglia in general. The ganglia is basically a cluster of neuron cell bodies or ganglion cells outside of the central nervous system. We'll also talk about the nerve itself. Um, so that will be these structures right here, leading to and away from the spinal cord. We will talk about their organization. You'll notice the terminology is going to look a little familiar here. We will talk about why that is. Um, We'll talk a little bit about myelin, probably not a lot, we already covered much of myelin last week, so we'll just mostly talk about how it differs from what we just talked about last week. And then we'll talk a little bit about these specialized nerve endings. There's many more than this. Uh, these are one that we will cover in this course. I just don't have the time to go over everything that's out there. Uh, so we will just stick to these three, the more plate, which we have talked a little bit about already. And then two touch receptors, the pachinian corpuscle and the Meisner's corpuscle. So, first of all, the peripheral ganglion. As I said, anytime you hear the term ganglion, it's referring to cell bodies or neurons outside the central nervous system. It's a cluster of neural cell bodies. The ones we will be looking at today are quite large. So they will be the dorsal ganglia that will be shown here is both um, coming into the spinal cord. Okay, so that will be one of the larger ones that we can look at. Um, that will be one of the ones that I think we have available for you guys to look at in your slide boxes. But that doesn't mean that's the only type of ganglia you can have. You can have much smaller clusters of cells where you might see four or five or six neuron cell bodies um, outside of the central nervous system, kind of together, clustered together to make a very small ganglion. Okay. So, again, we're looking really for a bunch of neuron cell bodies outside of the central nervous system. Now, as I mentioned to you last time, um, your body makes a, a very major effort in isolating components of your nervous system, specifically the neurons and the processing of those neurons from everything else. And so associated with those neuron cell bodies are going to be supporting cells, ones that will help to isolate the neurons from everything else around them. And so we do have the ganglion cells, which are the neurons. And these can be quite large. In many cases, pseudo-unipolar neurons, they will have, again, that typical pale nucleus of a dark central nucleolus, <coughs> owl's eye appearance of the nucleus, um, and they will show something called lipofusion, or H-gradient. Um, 
We will tend to see this on slides wherever we have any kind of cells that are permanent cells. Okay? So cells that do not divide. So cells that are kind of there for your life. Um, so things like neurons, for example. Cardiac myocytes over time will accumulate lipofusion as well. Basically, lipofusion is material that does not get completely broken down by your cell, does not get completely recycled by your cell, and so it's simply kind of stored within the cell in some sort of storage vesicle off to the side where it doesn't really do anything, doesn't cause the cell any damage, but it's just kind of there as kind of a waste product, and so it can't be really different. And so, uh, we tend to see this in a lot of these permanent cells, especially when you're looking at more mature tissues. The reason we haven't seen it so far in most of your tissues is that the tissues that you can see on your slides so far have been from very young individuals, have been taken from very young immature individuals. Uh, whereas if you're looking at some of the more mature tissues, you're much more likely to see this sort of thing. Okay, you can think of it this way. When cells are young, they are very efficient and they're very good at breaking things down and they as they age, they become less and less efficient, and so they do not break things down as efficiently as they used to. They do not break them down as completely as possible, and so we end up with a bunch of waste product just kind of sitting there within itself, and that builds up. And so over time, we have enough of that buildup happening that you can actually visibly see it within the cell. So you don't even have to stain the cell in any way. It just shows up as kind of colored pigment sort of product. It just kind of sticks out, and you will see this on your slides this week in the labs where you have a bridge being used for the slot, for the actual tissue and the cells. And within those cells, you will see this kind of a greenish brown sort of pigment showing up. Uh, that will be the light diffusion pigment. Now, surrounding those cells are going to be the supporting cells, which will be acting to kind of isolate those neurons from the connective tissues, from the outside environment. For the Basically, anything that is not nervous tissue, anything that is not neuron, it would be considered by your central nervous system and peripheral nervous system to be the outside. And so, there's a lot of effort put into isolating the nervous tissue from the outside. You saw in the central nervous system, we had astrocytes playing a very important role in isolating the central nervous system from everything else. We saw that they formed the blood brain barrier, uh, at least part of it. I also saw that they also form that outer covering of the brain before you get into uh, the meninges. Okay, so um, we have that layer produced by the cytoplasmic process that covered the surface of the brain as well. Again, that was all an effort to isolate the that nervous system from the outside. And so again, we see this here. And what we have are these cells, the satellite cells. Yeah, I've seen this term before. Again, it's not specific to muscle. It's not specific to this. To just satellite cells because they're surrounding something else. And so these satellite cells are basically similar to oligodendrocytes in many ways. They are glial cells. And they are going to be responsible for isolating that neuron from the outside environment, from that connective tissue that will be outside of those cells. So they are going to be there to help maintain the microenvironment around the neuron. They are going to be there to provide metabolic support for that neuron. Again, that neuron has to be fed somehow. It's got to get its nutrients and oxygen somehow. And again, the passage of those materials to the neuron is going to be fairly controlled by these satellite cells. Um, they will isolate the neuron also in terms of um, electrical insulation. They will very tightly control what concentration of ions outside of the neuron versus outside of the tissue. <coughs> so let's really quickly make a sketch. This is your ganglion cell, your nucleus and nucleolus. And then we have, again, it's a pseudo-unipolar cell, so here's the round body. And the afferent and inferent processes going in and out. And so surrounding the neuron cell body, we have a layer of Continuous layer of cells. 
Charles. I mentioned electrical insulation. Why would we need electrical insulation around the world? Well, out here is going to be connective tissue. And so out here we've got connective tissue. These are satellite cells. cells are basically fibroblasts. They just simply are joined together and they make a fairly continuous outer layer. Again, just basically an extra layer of, um, of boundary between that central nerve or that, that nervous tissue and everything that's outside of this. Because what we have outside of this is like the tissue, we've got blood vessels, who knows what's passing through those blood vessels <coughs> and suspended out of the tissue. And so you really want to have you want to have very tight control over what comes into contact with this neuron. And so you've got these layers of cells there to help ensure that <coughs> the environment around that neuron is very tightly controlled. Now by the way, again, when we have the neuron fiber, the neural fibers, you will have myelin here as well. So that myelin within the ganglion is going to provide get more of that insulation <coughs> around the actual fiber. So again, the fiber itself is also not going to be affected by any fluctuations of, of ions outside of that environment. So we have okay, So again, satellite cells closely associated with the cell body of the ganglion cell. And then we have capsule cells, specialized fibroblasts around the outside of that. What does it look like? 
here it is by a very low power micrograph of a dorsal root ganglion. So what we have here is basically the whole structure. So this whole structure here is the dorsal root ganglion. Again, let's go back to the sides. This structure right here and a longitudinal section. So we can see that there is nerve fibers coming into this, nerve fibers leaving this, and right at this bulge is where we have all of those ganglion cell bodies. So let's go through this. Again, we've got a nerve coming in and they're leaving, now, which side is in and which one's out, it's hard to tell. So, this could be nerve coming in, this could be nerve leaving, or the other way around, it doesn't really matter. Okay? And what we have here is this cluster of ganglion cells. Even at this kind of indication, you can kind of make out that there are these round structures within this ganglion. And so these nice round structures that you're seeing here that are kind of isolated, those are the ganglion cells themselves. This uh, more blue staining material around the outside is the actual connective tissue. So this structure is encapsulated. And so it does have a connective tissue capsule surrounding it. And there's going to be some connective tissue within the interior as well. But one of the things that we will be seeing also is not only are we going to see the cell bodies within this, but also we can see the myelinated fibers coming in and out of these cells. If we zoom in on this, you can see that here. Again, each one of these structures here are the cell bodies of the ganglion ones. And you can see that they are nicely isolated from everything else. They kind of each have a kind of shell around themselves. And you can see these very poorly stained fibers here, they're kind of looking wavy, fairly poorly stained. And those are the myelinated fibers coming in. What we're really seeing here are the Schwann cells and the myelin. And then periodically we might see a few uh, collagen fibers in there passing through, as well as some blood vessels. Let's zoom in on one of these cells. And by the way, there's a blood vessel right here. So you can see that it does have to be vascularized. You need to keep these cells. But again, whatever is passing through out of that blood vessel has to pass through the capsule and through the um, through, through the satellite cells to actually reach that ganglion cell. So when you zoom in on one of these ganglion cells, you can see the ganglion cell itself, and its large cell body. We have the, neuro, the nucleus and the nucleolus, the visible. And around the other side, you can see these nice round nuclei. And they're closely associated with the cell body. These belong to the satellite cells. Again, you're not seeing a nice neat row of these things, because these cells are basically making a three-dimensional covering, outer sheath around that ganglion cell. Not all of it there are going to be visible. And then these more flattened nuclei on the outside uh, that we're seeing, especially here and here, would belong to the capsule cells, those fibroblasts that make up that outer shell. Now, the other thing that we can see on here, well, not on this particular slide, but on the previous one, is again, we've got the nerve fibers coming in, and those will be surrounded by the Schwann cells, producing that sheet, the myelin sheet. And so, the Schwann cell itself is the part that produces the myelin. And basically, you've got one cell for one segment of myelin. So, unlike the central nervous system, where you have an oligodendrocyte sending off multiple processes in different direction, uh, and each one of those processes wraps itself around an actual axon and makes a pretty small segment of myelin. And here what you have is the whole cell wraps itself actively around the axon, and so one cell equals one segment, or one interval. Now, again, we've talked a little bit about the class of Schmidt-Langeman or incisures. Um, they're shell diagrammatic over here. They're these kind of a uh, small slits that you tend to see under the microscope. If you look at an actual slide of um, a nerve fiber, you can see the myelin sheet. You will quite often see this kind of diagonal line across 
going across that uh, myelin sheet, which is the inside shirt. Uh, we talked about why those are important last uh, year. Now, the node of Rodney is the region where the two internodes meet. So let me just flip back to one of these drawings from last time. And so on this drawing, what we have is just a single node, no, sorry, so one internode. This is the node of Rodney here, and there will be another segment of myelin on either side of this. Now, there's this exposed region here, which is the node of Rondi itself. Again, you do not want this region to be exposed, just like you don't want the cell body of the ganglion cell to be exposed to any fluctuations in concentrations of ions outside of this region. So, what's going to happen is that the Schwann cells themselves extend their cytoplasm into this region, uh, and they basically make some junctional complexes here, the same as a zonula occludens, basically some tight junctions are put in place to prevent any passage of material in between these cells. So that again, the Schwann cells will very tightly control which ions and what concentration of ions is going to be able to make it across into this region around the axon. Not only are the Schwann cells going to be feeding it, but also controlling ionic concentration in this region around the lower body. So, what we have is where the two internal meets, we have the lower body, which is going to be covered by what is referred to as the internodal, or oh, sorry, the nodal cytoplasm. We watch it this way. We've got an animation going on that shows you how a Schwann cell would go about actually producing the amount of sheets. So, the mission just wraps itself around and it kind of fuses its membranes in here, and then they start to rotate and wrap the cell around and around. And so, again, what we have here is that periaxonal cytoplasm that you see that we talked about last week. What we see have on the outside is that perinuclear cytoplasm of the Schwann cell. And again, the two of them need to be able to communicate somehow, which is why we have those uh, plexus of schmidt mansion and all the within the actual myelin sheet. So we saw this last week, and just by looking at this slide, you would be able to tell me, hopefully, that this is a stack of nerve fibers coming from the peripheral nervous system. And we know this because we have incisions. So we can see on this section the nerve fiber here. You can see very clearly these very small, kind of somewhat diagonal, lighter staining regions within the actual myelin sheet itself. You can see that this is what a node of Rondi looks like right here or right here. There's a much larger indentation there, it's much clearer. Whereas the actual incisors are much smaller and they happen much more frequently. Okay, so, again, this is the beginning of a no an internode. And if we follow this up, maybe you know, a little bit more, you might see the end of that one. Okay, but you can see that these do not occur very frequently. You can have, you've got a whole segment here, and we don't see the node of across this whole slot. So these are very, very long stretches. Okay, so uh, the peripheral nervous system, the myelin sheath uh, segments are quite long. In the central nervous system, they are quite short. Also, in the peripheral nervous system, the node of it is a smaller region. The node of Rondi here is basically just used for that saltatory conduction. Whereas in the central nervous system, the node of Rondi is also where the, um, the astrocytes can come into contact with the axon to provide that metabolic support. Okay, and so in the central nervous system, the node of Rondi is wider than in the peripheral nervous system. Again, in the peripheral nervous system, you've got the cell body of the Schwann cell around the outside of the myelin whereas you don't have that cell body around the outside of the myelin in the central nervous system. The central nervous system also does not require you to have a basal lamina around the outside of the cell, whereas in the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cells actually do have a basal lamina surrounding them, again, kind of acting as an extra layer of protection, an extra barrier, uh, before you can get to the actual neurons. So you've got a basal lamina around the outside, then the Schwann cell, then the myelin sheath, than the actual axon itself. <coughs> I threw this slide in here just to remind myself that I should also talk about one of the 
functions of Schwann cells is to help with the regeneration of nerves or nerve fibers. So I'm sure we've all heard stories about some person who has some sort of an accident, a um, accident or something, where a finger's cut off or something, and all they have to do is just find that finger, make sure it's clean, get to the hospital, and get it sewed back on. And at some point, they will be able to restore function to that finger. So that finger can be reattached, and it can start to function after a while, after it heals properly, it does return to normal function, at least relatively normal function. And the reason that happens is that the uh, after damage occurs, after you sever, say, say a finger, you have basically a break in the axon. First thing that's going to happen is, well, there's going to be some changes in the cell itself. So the cell's going to react to this um, quite often microscopically. The nucleus becomes more eccentric, so it goes off center a little bit. Uh, the cell does lose a little bit of that um, uh, missile substance, so you have a little bit less missile staying within the cell. Uh, the cell starts to focus on making a lot of free ribosomes and then trying to regenerate all of this. There's going to be some breakdown of this axon in this direction here, and pretty much all of the axon here, or all of the axon on this side here, is going to be degraded. Uh, and so the Schwann cells will proliferate, they will help with this process of breaking down that um, torn off uh, axon. Uh, there will be also macrophages that will be allowed to enter into the area to help out the patina as well. Now, one thing think about the proliferation of the, um, of the Schwann cells is that it will allow them to act as a guide for the regrowth of that axon. Because what's going to happen at this end here uh, is that this axon here is going to start sprouting. Actually, they're called sprouts. Uh, sprouting small um, tendrils of the cell in different directions. They're going to start searching for a pathway to which they can start to grow again. And so once you have one of these tendrils or sprouts actually enter back into the former myelin sheet or that Schwann um, pathway, it's going to be able to be guided by these Schwann cells back to its original target. And so over time what's going to happen is that you're going to lose these other sprouts and the myelin sheet will be formed and you will be able to regain function with that muscle that was probably about to be integrated initially. One thing to note here is that um, notice that we have changes in the muscle itself as well. If you sever a nerve, if you sever, sever a nerve fiber leading, leading to a muscle that innervates a muscle fiber, that muscle fiber, if this one is skeletal muscle fibers, is going to react to this as well. Skeletal muscle fibers require innervation or to function. They need to have that signal coming in periodically to remind them to keep on working. If they don't have that signal coming in, they will start to atrophy, they will start to shrink in size. If these cells are not being used, remember cells are very efficient, they will simply not make any new proteins, they will start to over time lose some of the myosin and acne filaments, and so they will start to shrink. Now, once that innervation is restored again, these muscle fibers will start to again receive signals from their neurons, and so they will again start to build up the, the protein mass that they require to function, and so they will return back to normal again. Now, this last part here, this last panel, shows what happens if you don't reattach the finger properly. Okay? If you don't get the this tube here, this um, this cutout region, with them close enough proximity to these set of sprouts here, they will never be able to find their target again. So they kind of just tangle up, whereas this kind of a schwa tube here is going to just remain in place, never be used. And again, that muscle doesn't atrophies until it just remains this kind of inactive cell. And that's when you no longer can actually have function or this neuron here is not actually going to be used for anything in particular. So again, the reattachment has to be fairly precise so that you can align this region here with this region here so that these sprouts can find their target again. 
Now, in this central nervous system, this sort of thing is actually inhibited. Can anyone think of any reasons why maybe it might make sense that you might want to inhibit the regrowth of axons in the central nervous system? <coughs> Now, think about it this way. This is not going to be the only nerve fiber there. Okay. If you're going to sever a finger, you're going to have multiple nerves going to innervate all the muscles in your finger. Okay. You cut that off, you reattach it. You're going to have multiple of these processes occurring side by side. What happens if we sever a spinal cord? Right? There's paralysis. Why doesn't it go away? Sorry? It's a much more complex system. Okay. You've got, think of this, but multiply it by a thousandfold, okay, or a millionfold. You've got a lot more of these nerve fibers going down the line. Okay. And there, unlike in your finger, where Pretty much all the these tubes are going to some sort of muscle in your finger. You can eventually relearn to use them properly. If this is a spinal cord, you're dealing with a hell of a lot more information passing through back and forth. If you have things off by just a little bit, you could have regrowth into another tube of these, in that case it would be oligodendrocytes, I suppose. Um, but what's going to happen then? What if it regrows into the wrong tube? Or if it's guided down the wrong path, all of a sudden you have an axon that used to be able to tell you to you know, move your foot forward or kick the soccer ball or something. Now it's sending its messages to just completely the wrong place. So in the central nervous system, potentially because it's just so much more complicated, uh, your body actually actively inhibits the regrowth of axons. So one of the challenges that scientists have, the ones who are working on trying to deal with paralysis, uh, the ones who are dealing with stem cells and trying to regrow axons and, and so on, is this idea of dealing with the body's own strategy for basically preventing this sort of thing from happening. Okay? So one of the things that, for example, astrocytes will be doing is they will be pro uh, producing a protein, I think it's called a pivot, I don't remember exactly. But that protein actually inhibits the regrowth of axons whenever there is damage. And whenever you lose a neuron, whenever a neuron dies, the space that it occupied quite often becomes occupied by glial cells, specifically astrocytes. It's called a glial scar. So you won't have new neurons being generated in most cases. Neurons don't divide. There are some stem cells apparent in the central nervous system that are capable of uh, differentiating into fresh neurons. But for the most part, whenever a neuron dies, it's simply replaced by glial tissue, glial scar tissue, or astrocytes. So, peripheral nervous system is probably allowing this because it is a simpler system. You have a nerve going one, one direction, chances are it's going to be innervating one particular region. Uh, and so again, if, even if you miss a tube by one, you're going just the wrong tube, you're still going to be hitting a, a similar group of muscle fibers. And so you're still going to be able to regain at least some function in that separate thing. Okay, speaking of nerves. Let's talk about So first of all, we have Thick, how much myelin there is going to be around it. 
and then around the outside of that myelin is going to be that perinuclear cytoplasm of the Schwann cell. Now, surrounding that is a very, very thin layer of connective tissue composed mostly of reticular fibers. Now, although it is rare, you may sometimes see a capillary in there somewhere, so there might be some blood vessels in there very small blood vessels. And one of the cells that is sometimes present there will be mast cells. Together, these are the endoneurions. Now, a bunch of these will be served by another layer of connective tissue that's a little bit thicker. This layer of connective tissue is likely to have larger blood vessels, venules, arterioles. outer layer in here is the carry layer. And this whole structure is a nerve fascicle. cells because they have some properties of epithelial cells, but they're not really an epithelium. Okay, the 
endothelial cells have contractile properties. They are capable of producing They're also capable of producing a lot of this material here. So the connective tissue around the outside, part of the tissue produced by the epithelioid cells. But the reason they're really called epithelioid cells is because they have basal lamina. And they have tight junctions. We also know them as lasagna occlusions. So basically, these cells, you can see, they're going to be surrounding this fascicle. And if they're going to be joined by tight junctions, that means that nothing is passing in between them unless they specifically allow it. So these cells have very tight control over what passes across from the perimerium into the endoderm. That would include things like oxygen, nutrients, and other cells that pass across as well. Again, it's a way of isolating your nervous tissue away from everything else in the outside world. Now, the actual reticular fibers here are going to be produced by the Schwann cells themselves. So you're unlikely to see any fibroblasts in the end of your own. So really, you're only going to see Schwann cells there. You might see some mast cells periodically. And again, there might be a epithelium here and there because you might see a few capillaries passing through this region as well. But again, for the most part, this is going to be acting as a barrier. So these epithelial cells are going to be making up the blood in our barrier. Now, in this case here, this was not stained for myelin. 
right? So you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit, or well, it's point really, really hard to see some of the stuff I'm going to be pointing to. Uh, but if you look very closely at this dot right there, it's a dark dot surrounded by a clear area around it. That clear area is the myelin sheet. Yeah, it wasn't stained this way, in this case, because we're not staining for lipids on this slide. So you've got a little dot right in the center here, and it's surrounded by a little bit of a very pale area, no staining, which is the myelin sheet itself. And then around that myelin, there's a slightly darker kind of outline, which would be the actual Schwann cell itself, along with that endoneurium. And as you can see it throughout this, you've got these kind of outlined pale regions with a dark dot in the center. Again, yeah. this is the axon cylinder, a little bit of myelin around it, and then surrounded by the Schwann cell and the endomerium. You can see that it is organized into this bundle here. Okay. This bundle is that nerve fascicle, which is going to be initially surrounded by those like helioid cells, which tightly control what passes through into that, uh, into that fascicle. And then around the outside of that, we've got some looser connective tissue that might have some blood vessels within it. So this would be the perineurium. And then you can see a whole bunch of these fascicles together. Okay, some are bigger than others, making up a whole nerve. And the outside of that nerve will have an epineurium, which is a thicker layer of connective tissue, which is what we aren't really seeing it, but will be visible right around here with the epineurium. Another example, in this case, this was stained for lipids. So in this case here, you can see these kind of empty spaces. These are the axon cylinders. The dark outlines around them is the myelin sheet. And again, notice some of them are thicker than others. So again, in each case, the axon determines how much myelination it requires and how much insulation it requires. Then around the outside of that myelin sheet, in this kind of pale pink area here, is where you would find the cell body of the Schwann cells, as well as that endothelium. And periodically you'll notice there's a few places where you're going to have an opening that kind of looks like a blood vessel. So yeah, you do in fact have some vascularization in as well. But again, you can clearly see this is all bundled together, so it is all kind of stuck together. Um, form a fascicle. And again, on the outside of that fascicle, you have those epithelioid cells, which are unfortunately not very clearly stained here, uh, because again, the slide is also stained for just the lipid cell, for the myelin. And you can see here, these blobs of black are fat cells. So we're seeing them here within the connective tissue. You can see some bloody blood vessels here as well. And there's the edge of the fascicle right there. So you can see that this is like it would be the perineurium over here. And again, a lot of this empty space you're seeing here is likely to be an artifact of operation. So this stuff does get damaged, especially when it's relatively loose with the tissue, and so it has to become more separated than it normally would be in the living tissue. This slide is here to remind me to tell you about another interesting thing about nerves. When you look at cross section of a nerve on a typical HME prepared stock, it kind of looks like this, it's kind of weird. You can see there's some regions that we can see cross sections through our nerve, and some regions that kind of look more like a longitudinal or an oblique section. So what's going on here? Well, what we have is, or what we know is that nerves are actually organized kind of like a rope. They're kind of winding, so they're not going straight through from your spinal cord all the way down to your fingertip. They're actually winding kind of like a rope. So if you look at a rope, you can see that it actually twists. Right? And that's how nerves are organized as well, is that those fascicles kind of twisting together uh, and making up this kind of rope-like sort of arrangement. The question is why? Here's the answer. I can stretch without damaging my nerves. Right? Nothing I have said so far has told you anything about our nerves' ability to withstand stretch. I haven't mentioned any elastic fibers or anything like that. 
an acrosome doesn't seem to have any inherent plasticity to it. So if you were to pull on the ends of an axon, which would be difficult to do initially, I guess, but once you got a hold of it, it would probably break very easily. Okay? Axons aren't meant to stretch. Okay? They're very thin, very fine fibers. So why can't we get up in the morning and just stretch? And then, you know, go up and do whatever. Why can't I go out and do yoga? and still be okay afterwards. Because the nerves themselves are organized like a rope, they're twisted. And so when you stretch, they untwist a little bit to allow for that stretch to be accommodated. So you're not damaging your nerves as you're pulling them. As you're pulling them, you're simply unwinding them, and they basically accommodate that stretch that you need to have. So again, when you're looking at actual slides, what you've been seeing so far, all of this, those are some excellent examples of nicely uh, cut, cut uh, nerves that were specifically positioned so that they could be cut in such a way that you would have a really neat looking um, cross section to work your bundle. Okay? On actual slides, in manual tissue, in a typical tissue slide, chances are you're going to see something that looks more like this. We see a region that is cross section, and another part of it is starting to twist because your section is not exactly right across your actual unit itself. And so you have to see this kind of an arrangement. Okay, so don't be surprised if you see that. And that's because of how these nerve fibers are actually arranged. These bundles are going together in kind of a twisted sort of arrangement like a rock, like a rope. Okay. So let's move on to nerve angles. Let's see if we can look at this. I must be missing something. Okay, so let's talk about nerve endings and we'll start with the water end of it.
get a passive on those collectors. So we can have a whole bunch of these fibers kind of packed together. We'll perform very similar functions. allowing us to draw a full version line right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just really quickly going to color in the ones that we're interested in. So the ones that are actually innervated by our axon. to notice that not every one of them is going to be innervated by this particular set of interventions. So far it doesn't look that way, but it will be this. This one also is innervated. Okay, so we have so fine, but we're just going to number them. So this one is also number one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now we have colored in number two, number four, five, six, and seven. Our diagram. The others will be integrated by just a different axon. So, fibers 2, 4, 5, 6, and 7 plus this axon and the neuron that provided this axon are referred to as a motor unit. Your motor units are in your arms, your legs, your fingers, etc. 
will tend to be controlled by how much you use them. So for example, the motor unit on the back of the dancer, the ballet dancer, for example, probably will be much finer, or smaller than the motor units on the back of a weightlifter. Okay? Because they're using their back muscles for different reasons. The finest motor units you have are the motor units that control the motion of your eye. So the little muscles that control the movement of your eyeball, ones that are constantly moving, those are the finest motor units you have because they can really pinpoint things very finely in terms of where your eyeball is pointing at and what is going to focus on. So this is a schematic diagram. Let's zoom in on this. Let's take a look at a region like this and try to get an idea what that might look like. So let's kind of zoom in on that part. And they basically allow for the cell to have more receptors for the neurotransmitters so that the cell can become more easily depolarized. So it can receive the signal much more easily. Now, my, the Schwann cells themselves do have a basal lemon around the outside. So it's going to be surrounding the outside of this island sheet as well as the Schwann cells. Let's see what we have. The basal line there. And the one here. The basal. Which will fuse with the basal 
muscle ladder of the muscle fiber. And enter into the synaptic cleft. surface of the junctional folds, we're going to have receptors for the hand here. Again, the more fold, the more receptors you can have on it. Just kind of the point of having a receptor with the junctional folds to begin with. So these are the receptors. What's going to happen is there's going to be an action potential coming down from the neuron. Again, as we saw in the last week, this action potential is going to trigger the opening of calcium channels. Anytime you have calcium rushing into the cytoplasm, rushing into the cell, something's going to happen. And so in this case here, the calcium is going to cause the blocking of these synaptic vesicles with the presynaptic density. Transmitter binds with the receptor on the surface, which opens up some channels here, which allows uh, ions to exchange to rush into the cell and change their potentials. So sodium will be able to, or potassium will be able to flow in, increase the charge, the positive charge on here, and that's going to send a wave of depolarization down the length of the membrane here. Contact with the tumor cisterna that's going to release the calcium into the cell. 
which is going to cause contraction. Okay. So, um, a few more things. We don't really want to say the poly to be sticking around here for too long. So what is the cell going to do? What's going to happen? Reuptake, so we can have reuptake of single folding. Uh, quite often, what happens actually is we have enzymes embedded within this region. Acetylcholine, so it's no longer going to be functional in terms of activating these receptors. Now, you also want to be able to pump the calcium out of the cell. We're going to do this actively, which is why we're going to have mitochondria at the terminal gluton as well. How do you think those mitochondria got there? What kind of transport? Retrograde? Retrograde? What is it? Interrogate. Hmm? Interrogate. Interrogate? My uh, neuro. Okay, so is it a So we do have basically transport along the aptin to tubules, microtubules within the actual uh, axon itself, and there will be motors, motor proteins that will actually carry these organelles all the way down. Okay, so we're going to have a whole bunch of mitochondria here, which will provide the ATP for pumping the calcium back out, so that this terminus is once again ready to receive another impulse so that it can be fired off again and again through these ammonia transmitter to the synaptic class, etc. So it can continue to stimulate the muscle. Okay. Which is, I think, where I've basically covered on it here. Okay. Now, a few terms that are showing up here, or one term that is showing up on here, that I haven't mentioned yet is this right here. One of the characteristic appearance, or things about the appearance of a neuromuscular junction is the fact that the terminus of the axon looks very odd. Okay? So let's, if we were to actually try to draw this, it would probably be more appropriate to draw it like this. Because it actually spreads itself over the surface of the muscle to make as efficient and as, as wider area as possible that will be in contact with the actual muscle fiber. Okay? And so this is referred to as a crow's foot. To me, it kind of looks under the microscope like a bunch of grapes. <laughs> it does. Look at them yourselves. It'll kind of look like a bunch of grapes. Okay? So, but it's referred to as a crow's foot. Okay, and basically it allows for a much wider interaction of that muscle of that axon terminus with the surface of the muscle fiber so it can activate it more easily. Okay, so again I think I've covered most of this. This is what it actually looks like. So again, you can see an axon coming in, splitting off into multiple branches. So you can see that we have a philodendria here. And notice again at the very ends, you have these kind of bunches of these kind of granular looking endings right at the surface of that muscle fiber. Yeah. So basically, this whole thing would be the motor end plate. What really happens is that we're looking at this terminal bouton like this, but what it really does is actually it kind of snakes along the surface of actually a very elongated sort of structure that kind of snakes its way across the surface of the muscle fiber as you mentioned. Okay. 
Okay? So, um, if you were to just take a section to it, it might kind of look like this in various places. Uh, but in reality, if you were to look, take a look at it from the top, it kind of does make its way kind of bulge in places. So it does have this kind of granular appearance right at the surface. And the whole thing is the actual motor of the plate itself. Okay? Which is probably one of the reasons that it's called the plate as opposed to the little top. So again, one apps I'm coming in is putting it off, and again, this motor and plate engraved on cell that's kind of out of the plane of section here. And then a couple of the motor nerve endings on a few other muscle fibers. And again, notice not every single muscle fiber in a row is innervated by this one axon. So it's not like you have one axon getting um, muscle fiber 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then I have another one taking 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. They tend to be split up. Okay? Now, again, having, and this has to do with basically having smaller or larger motor units. Now, having better control over that is what allows you to hold an egg or crush an egg. If you're holding a gen, you're only activating a few of your motor units. If you're trying to crush it, you're activating all of them. Okay? And again, you can exert different levels of force. And the fact that you can have so many different amounts of force or levels of force that you can exert on that eggshell um, is a testament to how many different motor units you actually have controlling the muscles of your fingers. Okay, so let's talk about the sensory endings. So we talked a little bit about how we can move. So let's talk a little bit about how we can actually sense the environment around us. Unfortunately, we won't get to talk about eyes or hearing, but Okay, so two sensory structures that we'll talk about today. One is called the Pacinian corpuscle, the other one is called the Meisner's corpuscle. They're both responsible for the sense of touch. Um, one of them is a bit more sensitive than the other, one of them is a little closer to the surface of the skin than the other. How do you tell them apart? Um, one of the things that has helped me remember which one is which, because it could be easy to mistake one for the other, I guess, if you're not familiar with the technology. The Puccini corpuscles are big fat. It's a big fat structure. It's actually visible with the naked eye if you actually look at it. Look for it. Uh, so it can't be detected with the naked eye. It is big enough to be detectable. Okay? They're about one millimeter or so um, in diameter. Meisner's corpuscle is much smaller than that. If you listen to classical music, an opera, you might be familiar with Puccini. Whenever I think of Puccini, I think of opera. I'm big fat guys on stage singing. And I can always then think of the Puccini corpuscle. I don't have a similar one for my I'm sorry. You have to find for yourselves. Okay, so what is a Puccini corpuscle? Um, it is a touch receptor. Um, it basically senses pressure and vibration. This type of touch receptor is, tends to be fairly deep within your skin. So um, if we look at skin, we have several layers of skin. You have the outermost layer. So this is the surface. And the outermost layer, which is the stratified skin of epithelium. This is referred to as the epidermis. which means the pot dermis. The next layer down is connective tissue. And you know that this is a dense irregular connective tissue. This is referred to as the dermis. And beneath that we have a layer all have it. Don't fight it. <laughs> we all have it. So it's referred to as the hypodermis. Some of us have a thicker layer than others, I suppose. <laughs> this is mostly adipose. Okay. 
Now, I've drawn this region here, this interface between the dermis and the epidermis, as kind of a wavy line. This was done for a reason. This structure here is called a dermal papilla. And in three dimensions, you can basically think of it as kind of a projection into the epidermis. So you've got a layer of the epidermis, the skin, the, well, think of the skin, the surface layer. And the dermis, the connective tissue kind of invaginates into the interior to make this kind of a bulge. And then the epidermis kind of goes around it. So you have this kind of a wavy surface. One of the things about that is if you were to try to pull one against the other, this interdigitation allows for it to resist any kind of a shielding force, which is one of the things that makes your skin so tough. Because you pull on it in any direction, again, you've got the dermis and all those um, collagen bundles there, basically uh, opposing the forces that you're putting on. But if you're just kind of trying to put, putting a shearing force and just pressing against the side, just kind of trying to push it along the surface of the dermis, you can't because of these interdigitations. Because these dermal pili that make for a much tighter association between the epidermis, the epithelium, and that kind of tissue underneath. The other thing that they allow for is the fact that within these dermal papillae is where you're going to find the Meisner score fossils. They're kind of these bullet shaped sort of structures. And they will be here because this allows them to be closer to the surface. In fact, the skin on your fingertips is going to have a lot, of, a lot more of these dermal papillae. So the waviness here will actually be a little bit more like this. So instead of being this kind of a nice long wave, what we have is a much more tightly packed wave in places that are really sensitive. So really sensitive skin have many more of these dermal papillae and they are much deeper. Uh, and much closer back together. So within the dermal papillae, you're going to have lots of these nice and support muscles. So because they are close to the surface, they are responsible for fine touch. Okay? So these are the receptors that you're activating when you kiss your loved one, because your lips have lots of them. These are the receptors that you activate when you touch someone. Palms of your hands, soles of your feet are just full of them. They're packed of these types of receptors. Any sensitive part of your body, I know this is really sensitive, uh, lots of Meissner's corpuscles are going to be there. Down here is where you will find the Chinian corpuscles. And they kind of look like a slice of an onion. They are found in deeper layers, so the hypodermis and the lower dermis as well, so sometimes they might be found out here. Again, mostly in the palms of your hands, soles of your feet, and the breasts as well. Okay. Uh, there will be some also near internal organs as well. These are pressure receptors. So and these are pachinian.
and the Schwann cells that are responsible for that will instead make up this core region here of just heavy packed layers of Schwann cells. So you're going to have an unlimited fiber going right down the middle, and then around that fiber you're going to have multiple layers of these Schwann cells very tightly packed surrounding that unlimited fiber. Now, around this core region, okay, what you're going to have is then this kind of a, a capsule, an outer capsule, composed of modified fibroblasts. And those are going to be linked with one another to make up a layer of fibroblasts, and then a layer of fluid surrounding those fibroblasts, and then another layer of fibroblasts, more fluid, more fibroblasts, more fluid. So you have this kind of concentric arrangement of fiber, layers of fibroblasts and then a little bit of fluid. That fluid is very similar to what you find on the lid. Okay? So just a little bit of water and protein. And so what you have is this many, many layers of this fluid and this outer boundary of fibroblasts each time. And you end up with this kind of structure that kind of looks like an onion. Now the way this functions is that when you press down at the surface of the skin, so when you press down somewhere, <coughs> when you press down somewhere down here, you make a depression in the skin. That's going to press down on the dermis, that's going to press down on the hypodermis, and press down on this structure here. When you deform that capsule, that pressure gets pass down through all those layers of fluid down to that layer of Schwann cells and eventually that nerve fiber. And that's going to activate the nerve fiber and it's going to send a signal down back to your spinal cord saying there's pressure here, or there's vibration here. Something's going on. Okay. So basically it's all about deforming that outer capsule that's going to allow this nerve fiber to send out a signal. And again, it's going to be an action potential because Somewhere around here is where we're going to have that uh, axon hillock in that initial segment. Question? Yeah, so, uh, since it's located within the adipose tissue, does mm -hmm. that mean that areas with more adipose tissue would have more sensitive, would be more sensitive pressure? So, because it's an adipose tissue, people with more adipose tissue would be more sensitive to pressure. Or like different regions? I'm not necessarily sure that that would be the case. Uh, I don't think that the presence of these is dependent on the presence of adipose tissue. You just simply have a certain number of these things. Uh, I don't think it necessarily has to do with how much adipose tissue you have. It's possibly my computer, but again, that just means that you're going to have to press down through a lot more adipose tissue to hit some of those things, so you might need more of those. Okay? Uh, so just to retain the same sensitivity. I'm not sure that we would be more sensitive because they can have more vision cord muscles as a result. Okay, so that's the Pacinian corpuscle. So here's what it actually looks like under the microscope. This is a nice picture that I found. Um, not all of them will look this nice and obvious. So keep your eyes open. So right down the center is where we're going to have an axon. Around the other side of that is going to be that layer of Schwann, or multiple layers of Schwann cells making up that core. And then around here, all these nuclei you're seeing here are nuclei of those modified fibroblasts making kind of continuous layers. And the empty spaces that you're seeing here are the spaces that would be filled with fluid. So again, if you think about this, you compress this thing from the top, it's going to compress all the way down to that inner fiber and basically cause it to fire off. So that's one pitching corpuscle here. There's another one at the edge of one right there as well. So you can see there's actually a connected tissue capsule surrounding it. That's a fairly common feature of these things as well. And you also have to some connected tissue forming a capsule around this structure. And you can see out here a bunch of adipose tissue. So we are taking the hypodermis. And just to the left of the slide, you can see a bit more connected tissue. That's where the dermis is. The next one on the list is the Meisner's corpuscle. And it kind of functions in a very similar way. Again, yeah, it's all about deforming that, that capsule, deforming that structure. In this case here, what you have is maybe one or two, maybe three nerve fibers entering. So again, they initially are myelinated, but eventually they lose their myelination. And the cells that would form that myelin, the Schwann cell, 
will actually modify themselves to form this kind of a structure here. Where what we tend to see is uh, nuclei that are kind of flattened, that are parallel to the surface of the skin. And so if we try to draw this, what you have is a Schwann cell, a Schwann cell, a Schwann cell. So we have a multiple Schwann cells kind of forming this sort of structure, leading up to the top and kind of makes a new conical sort of shape to it. There is going to be some connective tissue around the outside of this. Uh, it's not always very prominent, not always very obvious. And the way that the nerve fibers actually pass through this is instead of going right down the middle, they will actually follow the layers of the Schwann cells through this structure. They will kind of coil through this structure all the way up to the top. So again, remember these are going to be oriented like this. They're going to be oriented like this. So the actual structure itself kind of has a long axis. That long axis is going to be perpendicular to the surface of the skin. And so when you're pressing down, you're actually pressing down on top of this thing. And so when you deform this, you're going to set off an actual potential down that nerve fiber, back to the spinal cord, into your brain. Okay? So that's how you're sensing the touch. Okay, and so where are these found again? Soles of your hands, uh, soles of your feet, palms of your hands, uh, any kind of sensitive areas, so your lips, uh, any other places, so your genitals, so the natural movement place where you find these. So again, very, fairly common structures, but really mostly found in places that are highly sensitive. And again, places that are highly sensitive are likely to have a lot more of these dermal, dermal papillae to allow for more of these structures to be present to be done. Uh, if you take a psychology course in sensation perception, I think Dr. Kennedy is still teaching it, you might do a uh, little experiment with you in class where he takes two needles and kind of tells you to close your eyes and he pokes you with those needles into different places on your forearm. And depending on how far apart they are, you'll either be able to feel two pins or just one. Okay? And basically that has to do with how far apart are your sensors away from one another. Okay? Again, in really sensitive areas, they're really close together. In areas that are less sensitive, your skin, the dermal papillae are much further apart, they're much wider, and so there's fewer of these receptors close to, close to one another. And so that's why you're feeling, you have different, different sensitivities on your skin depending on which part of your, of your body you're actually touching. Okay, okay so I think I'm going to cover pretty much everything on here. So here is an actual micrograph. I think it's not actually coming from the same picture as the, uh, the uh, other, as the Virginia corpuscle. So somewhere down here, way off, the actual side is where the hypodermis would be. This is all dermis. And then these are the dermal papillae that I was describing. You will notice that the epidermis, which starts from here all the way to the surface here at the edge, kind of looks like it has multiple layers. And it's actually does. Um, and when we have the C22 course, the second half of this course, they actually would have learned different layers and learned to recognize them and know what's exactly what we want to find those layers. But the thing to focus on in this one is uh, there will be multiple layers. They will look a little different. They might stain a little different, but it's still all epidermis. So look for these invaginations into the epidermis. And these invaginations are the dermal papillae. And periodically within them, you will find structures like this. They won't always be this clearly visible. Okay? Sometimes they are very, very pale stained. Uh, and so you might have to find, take some time to really find a few of those that can identify clearly as a mysomous corpuscle. Okay? So don't get discouraged initially when you don't find them all over the place. They may not all look like this. The reason that this slide is up here is because I thought this was a very good example of one. Uh, and it probably took a few hours to find this one. Okay? So uh, don't get discouraged if you don't find it your first try. Just keep on looking. They are there. Okay. So I'll stop here. Uh, I think my name is Phil. So if you guys are interested in sticking around, um, I can maybe do a part of a cancer lecture or something for you guys. And uh, we can try to talk a little bit about um, how histology can, kind of goes hand in hand with what uh, we learn when we're doing pathology.
Thank you.